So today we're talking about calculating the cost of capital. And uh, it's a very useful set of formulas to learn and very useful processes to learn. What we'll be specifically talking about is the weighted average cost of capital, or WACC, which is um, the average cost per dollar of capital raised. And um, it had been, and in the case of Canada, it's still a uh, simple way to determine what your cost of capital is using the weighted average cost of capital formula. A um, little bit more complicated in the States as the lecture will show here because of uh, the Tax Cut and Jobs Act of 2017. So there's some changes to how corporate taxes, tax rates are uh, treated. So there's now a flat 21%. Um, after tax cost of debt is not as subsidized as it was previously and constraints on when firms can deduct interest payments have been, um, have changed somewhat. So previously any interest paid on a firm's debt was completely deductible for tax purposes, uh, a totally deductible expense, but there's some constraints on that now. So in terms of debt interest using WAC, and this is just for the a US um, perspective, um, Canada, it's a fair bit more straightforward actually. So there are three scenarios in terms of um, how debt interest will be treated using the WACC formula. There's the unconstrained scenario, scenario where interest on all debt will be fully tax deductible. So that was the case for all interest before the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017 in the United States. Under the fully constrained scenario, the likelihood of being able to realize a tax shield on new debt on a new debt issue is so low or so far away in the future that it might as well not even exist. Um, so there wouldn't be any tax savings under this fully constrained scenario. Under an uncertain scenario, the impact, impact of the interest tax shields will fall somewhere in the, in the middle between the unconstrained scenario and fully constrained scenario. So in terms of um, questions you'll see, they should identify these things. And so it should be pretty, pretty easy for you to figure out which um, tax deduction you'll apply in terms of calculating the WACC. So this is the simple formula for the unconstrained scenario for determining your the WACC. The WACC unconstrained is equal to the percentage of equity times the cost of equity plus the percentage of preferred stock times the cost of preferred stock plus the percentage of debt times the after cost tax of debt. So each, uh, each piece of this formula is for a different type of capital for a firm, right? So the first is equity. Uh, this first chunk here under the formula, the E over E plus P plus D times IE, that is for determining the cost of equity. The cost of preferred stock is the next term, which is P over E plus P plus D times IP, right? So the cost of preferred debt. And then the final term is or sorry, the cost of preferred stock for the second term. And then the final term in the formula is for determining the um, cost of debt, which is the debt over E plus P plus D times uh, the cost of the debt multiplied by one minus the tax rate for the corporate tax rate. And of course, we'll be going over some um, examples here throughout the short lecture today. Uh, in the fully constrained scenario, it's the same formula. The only thing that changes is the last term for debt. You'll see that there's no um, deduction for tax. So that tax deduction, if you haven't seen that yet in other calculations and other classes, um, you'll start to see it fairly often in finance. It's just one minus the corporate tax rate. So it takes into account that, uh, that discount on, um, or not discount, that deduction you get to use for debt interest. In terms of calculating component cost of equity, there are a couple, a few different methods. So there's the capital asset pricing model that we talked about in chapter 10 um, before the break. And that formula is the, um, is IE equals the risk-free rate multiplied by beta 
times the market risk subtract the risk-free rate. And if you recall, the risk-free rate will be the T-bill rate for a federal government. Um, United States or Canada will be a lot of the questions we're dealing with. The market rate is going to be given to you, or you'll have to look it up, not in questions, but in real life, you will often have to do a little bit of research to determine the market rate and which rates you're going to use. Beta is, um, you can calculate beta using this formula. You can also look for beta. Um, usually in questions, as you'll recall, beta will be given to you or the other variables from the cap M formula here will be given to you and you can solve for beta. In the real world, um, you will get, you can go and look for beta. People have done those calculations on different uh, capital assets. And also in questions and exercises, you might see um, some historical data and you'll have to calculate a beta based on that. But um, so CAPM is uh, a good way to determine the cost of equity, but so is uh, the constant, if you have a constant growth stock, you can use the constant growth model that we've talked about uh, in the past few chapters as well, which is the interest rate of the equity or the, the return on this equity is equal to dividend one over price zero is zero for the stock plus the growth rate growth rate of that stock. And the growth rate has to be constant in this model. Remember, it can't change. With favorable assumptions, both methods will produce the same answer. Um, but reality might dictate uh, which method to use. So do not use cap M in situations where you do not have sufficient historical ob observations to estimate data. So or estimate beta, you want your beta to be um, reliable, or when you suspect that the past level of the stock's systematic risk might not be a good indicator of future risk. So if there have been significant changes um, to the, the company and that substantially adjusts its risk uh, variables, then the past systemic risk of the stock might not be a good indicator for the future. Uh, things can change, right? Um, as we've seen just in the past uh, few days, um, the war in Ukraine, for instance, has had a drastic effect on stock markets, of course, and capital markets. So events like that can really, um, as one example, there are many, many examples of things that could cause significant changes um, in determining risk for a corporation, right? So just something to really keep in mind. And it's very applicable in using CAPM. Using the constant growth model is not a good option for stocks that don't pay dividends or stocks that are uh, young or new with rapid growth, because that uh, growth rate is probably going to change um, in the future. As a young company with rapid growth matures, um, its growth rate isn't going to stay as high as it might be in the beginning. And of course, um, if a stock's not paying dividends, then how are you, it's difficult to calculate growth. In terms of uh, calculating the cost of preferred stock, it's just um, wherein um, we have a special case sometimes where with a constant growth model where G equals zero. And in that case, um, the return on preferred stock is equal to the dividend dividend one for the preferred stock over P zero of the preferred stock. And growth in this case is equal to zero. In terms of debt, uh, things are gonna get a little, um, can get a little trickier as we've seen working with bonds and what have you. So estimate before talk, estimate the before tax cost of debt by solving for the yield to maturity on the firm's existing debt. And that's what we did in top chapter seven using time value of money calculators, or you can use Excel to solve for the equation for the cost of debt. So this is the formula here, right? Present value equals payment multiplied by um, the first term, one minus one over one plus ID, which is the interest rate for debt to the power of N all over the interest rate for debt plus the future value over one plus the interest rate for debt to the power of N. And of course, um, a financial calculator is gonna be a lot easier and you'll see with 
couple examples in the lecture here in a few slides away that uh, using a financial calculator is much more straightforward, right? You just have to have a good idea and understanding on how to input the variables. In terms of calculating the weights to be used in the WACC formula, we're simply just going to calculate the percentages of the funding that come from equity, preferred stock, and debt, right? So we're going to look at our total capital for a firm. Uh, say it's $100 million. That's going to be made up of equity, preferred stock, and debt. Uh, it might have all three. It might not have some of the variables. But let's assume that we have all three in this $100 million capitalized company. We'll have equity which is just common stock plus preferred stock plus debt. We can assume that uh, if we continue with this example I'm just making up, say we have $40 million in common stock, $40 million in preferred stock, and $30 million in debt, right? So each stock is going to have 40% of the, uh, the firm's capital, and 30% of the capital is going to be from debt. And you'll see in the in our examples, it's quite straightforward to do. Also, we use market values when we are using the weighted average cost of capital formula. We don't use book values, especially for equity, because uh, um, book values for equity do not determine what the cost of that equity is. We need to use market values. Um, Next, we're going to do an example where we calculate the cost of equity for ADK industries, given the following information. So AD, ADK has a common stock price of $32.75. The next dividend is expected to be $1.54 per share, and the company expects future dividends to grow by 6% per year indefinitely. We are also given that the risk-free rate is 3%. The expected return on the market is 9%. And ADK has a beta of 1.3. So we can calculate the cost of equity using the cap M method in formula, which is uh, the, the return on equity or the cost of equity. The IE equals the interest free rate plus beta for the equity in that we're working with multiplied by the um, market rate of interest minus the risk-free rate of interest. So in this case, it's the risk-free rate is 0 0.03 or 3%. Beta was given to us as 1.3. Uh, the market rate of interest is 9%. And the risk-free rate again is 3%. You work all that through and you get 10.8%, which is the cost of equity common stock for ADK based on all this data we have here. So that's the first step. Using the constant growth model, um, we can also calculate a cost of common equity for this company uh, using the constant growth model, which is the dividend one divided by price of the stock at zero times zero plus the growth rate. In this case, it's $1.54 is the dividend divided by a stock price of 32, $32.75 plus a constant growth rate of 6% gives you um, a cost of equity or a return of 10.7%. And then you just average the two to get your best estimate for your cost of equity in this case, right? The first one using the cap M 10.8 plus the 10.7 divided by two gives you a best estimate of 10.75% for your cost of common equity for ADK. To calculate the cost of preferred stock, We'll use the uh, constant growth model for preferred, which is uh, D1 over P0. We're told that ADK has 1 million shares of 7% preferred stock. So that means that on every $100 of value, there's a 7% dividend. And the preferred stocks are currently trading at $72 per share. So what is ADK's cost of preferred equity? And it's simply the dividend of $7 divided by the current trading price of $72, which gives you 9.72% for the cost of preferred equity for ADK. In terms of calculating, calculating the cost of debt for ADK, the company has 30,000 
20 year 8% bonds outstanding. If the bonds currently sell for 97.5% of par and the firm has a marginal tax rate of 35.2%, what is the cost of debt for ADK? So a couple things here, the 97.5% of par, um, that means keep in mind that par for a stock, for a bond, as we saw in previous chapters is generally a thousand dollars and less otherwise stated. So the face value of this bond is a thousand dollars. You multiply that by 97.5 to get the current, uh, the present value of the bond, which you'll see here. If you're using a financial calculator, which you should for these calculations, because it's a lot more straightforward, the present value is negative 975 because it's an outflow. You have to purchase that bond for that amount to uh, get the returns. The payment is 8% of 1,000. So 8% times 1,000 gives you this $80 payment. That's the coupon. Um, the future value is the face value, which we assume to be $1,000 unless otherwise stated. And N is 20. They gave us that it's a 20 year bond. So we can solve for the interest rate, which is 8.26. So if the before cost, before tax cost of debt is 8.26, then the after tax cost of debt is 8.26 multiplied by one minus 0.21. So there's a bit of a, this marginal tax rate here is a little bit tricky. So keep in mind a marginal tax rate and a regular tax rate are not the same thing. What we use is the corporate tax rate, and it's a flat 21% now in the United States. Uh, in Canada, it's different, and in other countries, it's different. So generally, the question will give you what the tax rate is. Don't use the marginal tax rate. All right, that's just what I'm flipping back here. And in terms of calculating the, weight, calculating the weights, you need to do it for equity, so common stock, preferred stock, and debt. Um, the firm has $3 million shares of common stock outstanding, 1 million shares of preferred stock and 30,000 bonds. What are the relevant weights for ADK? So for equity, we take our stock price that we received earlier on in the example of 3275 and multiply it by 3 million shares to give us common equity market value of $98,250,000. Preferred stock has a market value of 1 million shares multiplied by $72 per share for $72 million in total market value of preferred stock. And debt has a market value of 30,000 bonds, or sorry, yeah, 30,000 bonds. I thought I was giving you the wrong number, but 30,000 bonds at a current price of $975 each gives you total market value of debt of 29250000 then you just figure out the proportion, right? And it's just a matter of taking each of common equity, preferred stock and debt and dividing it by the total of the three. So the total of all capital in this company is 199,500,000. And that's just adding up the um, 98.25 million, the 72 million and the 29.25 million is to get that 199,500,000. So common equity has 49.25% in terms of the weight of all, all capital for ADK, right? And it's just taking the value of common equity and divided by the total capital in the company. Preferred stock is 36.09% and debt is 14.66%. So now we can calculate the weighted average cost of capital for ADK using the unconstrained interest deduct deductibility, uh, which we talked about earlier on in the lecture. We take the cost of our common equity that we determined to be 10.75 in our first calculations, and multiply that by the weight of the common equity, which is 49.25%. Then we add to that the um, weight of the preferred stocks outstanding, which is 36.09% multiplied by 9.72%, which is the cost of our preferred stock. And then we add to that the, the bonds, the debt. So the debt has a weight of 14.66% of all of our capital multiplied by a cost of 8.26%, which we used uh, the financial calculator method for a few slides back, then multiplied by the uh, tax deductibility 
benefit, which is one minus the tax rate, the corporate tax rate of 21%. So you work that all out and we get a weighted average cost of capital for ADK of 9.76% using the unconstrained interest deductibility. Using the fully constrained interest, deduct interest deductibility, which means we aren't able to deduct the interest on the debt, um, we get a weighted average cost of capital of 10.01%. So you're saving 0.25% on your cost of capital, basically, between um, for the unconstrained interest deductibility versus the constrained. Just to give you an idea, right? If you can deduct interest, your cost of capital is going to be lower than if you can't deduct that interest on debt. So, and you'll see this in a lot of questions uh, that you go through for these um, for this chapter. Um, when we're using uh, weighted average cost of capital, do we use the firm's weighted average cost of capital or a project's weighted average cost of capital? So. Sometimes we'll use one or the other, right? And it can be a bit of a trick to determine which one is most appropriate. And so the question we want to answer is, can a firm managers use the firm-wide weighted average cost of capital to evaluate the firm's newly proposed projects? And it depends. If the new project is similar enough to existing projects, then yes, you can use the firm's weighted average cost of capital. But if the new project is riskier, or safer than the firm's existing projects, then it should be charged a higher or lower cost of capital. So what that means is you'll see some uh, questions and you'll see some circumstances and situations in real life where you need to determine, well, which weighted average cost of capital do I use? So it really comes down to risk, right? And similarity. You could also have a uh, divisional weighted average cost of capital. So some, a lot of companies have multiple divisions um, that can be somewhat different. So do, do firms calculate risk appropriate rate with WACC for every new project that they consider? Uh, no, because it wouldn't be feasible, but um, alternatively firms will often calculate divisional WACCs for a product line of the company based on that line, that line's uh, risk and what have you but not each individual product's risk profile. So they'll look at a division, right? And determine the weighted average cost of capital for that particular division and product line. In an all equity firm, uh, weighted average cost of capital is theoretically equal to the cost of equity, i.e. for each proposed project. And this will increase as the risk of the project increases. And there are all equity firms. So an all equity firm would be a firm that doesn't have any, any debt um, that it uses for capital, raising capital. In terms of sample projects uh, versus risk sensitive uh, weighted average cost capital. In this example, we have projects A and B that have expected returns greater than their risk appropriate weighted average costs of capital while projects C and D have expected returns less than their risk appropriate weighted average cost of capital. If we were to mistakenly compare projects with different risks to the single firm-wide weighted average cost of capital, then we would conclude that projects A and D have expected rates of return less than the firm-wide weighted average cost of capital, while projects B and C have expected returns greater than the firm-wide weighted average cost of capital. So B and C have um, higher returns than the weighted average cost of capital, and projects A and D have lower returns than the firm's weighted average cost of capital in this example. So just as an example of um, some incorrect decisions that can be caused by inappropriate use of a firm-wide weighted average cost of capital. If you're looking at this chart here, the gold shaded area on the bottom left, is the gold shaded triangle, uh, it contains projects such as project A, which is incorrectly rejected by the firm, by a firm in this example. It has less, it has risk that is less than the average risk of the firm. Its expected rate of return is greater than its correctly calculated risk appropriate WACC, but 
it's less than an appropriate than an inappropriately calculated firm wide WACC. And the pink shaded triangle on the upper right contains projects such as project C, which is incorrectly accepted by the firm and has a greater risk than the average risk of the firm. And its expected rate of return is less than a correctly calculated risk appropriate weighted average cost of capital, but it's greater than an inappropriately calculated firm wide weighted average cost of capital. So you can see how decisions can get complicated and convoluted pretty quickly just using this um, example here with four potential projects. So if risk is incorrectly calculated or um, a WCC, WACC is inappropriately calculated, then you can run into uh, pretty significant problems, right? In this case, project A was rejected when it probably shouldn't have been, and project, project C was accepted when it should not have been accepted because uh, the rate of return is less than a correctly calculated risk appropriate weighted average cost of capital. Also with respect to divisional weighted average cost of capital, computing a few risk aware divisional WACCs can greatly reduce the number of projects that greatly that get incorrectly accepted or rejected. So uh, it's a good thing to um, really can review the risk of different divisions and also to make sure that um, the weighted average cost of capital is correctly calculated for each division. Otherwise, that's when you run into these issues of accepting projects that shouldn't be accepted because they're too risky or the return isn't high enough. And this chart is just showing what the risk appropriate weighted average cost of capital would be. So there's a medium risk weighted average cost of capital, high risk and a low risk for this firm. Also, divisional weighted average costs of capital may be formed subjectively, simply by considering the project's risk relative to the firm's existing lines of business. But uh, the disadvantage using such a approach is that the adjustments are simply picked out of thin air and created just for the project at hand. Uh, did I miss it? No, I didn't miss anything there. So we want to use objective approaches an objective approach would compute the average beta per division. And then we would use these figures in the cap M formula to calculate the cost of equity for each division, and then use these estimates to construct divisional weighted average costs of capital. So the more precise, more precise than the subjective method, of course, resulting in fewer incorrect uh, accept or reject decisions like we saw in that example with projects A, B, C, and D. But it's more difficult to implement than the subjective approach. So there are trade offs, of course. Quotation costs. Um, so firms will often fund projects by issuing externally generated new capital, such as stock or bonds, to figure project weighted average costs of capital. Flotation costs must be integrated into component costs. And what flotation costs are, are fees paid by firms to investment banks for issuing new securities. So um, every time a firm goes out and issues a bond or a new, uh, a new round of stocks or a new, uh, I'm trying to, like they increase the number of shares out there, which is adding more shares to the marketplace, or they can add a different, um, class of stock, right? Like they're gonna add a class B or a second class of preferred, whatever the case may be. You'll see that a lot of companies have multiple classes of stock for many different reasons. And when they do that and they issue those, those securities, of course, they have to, there's a cost to that, right? Because they don't issue them directly. As you'll recall from a lecture quite a ways back, there are intermediaries in the financial markets and investment banks are a significant uh, part of the financial markets. So they provide the liquidity and then sell these securities on behalf of the corporation to other investors. 
So that's where all these flotation costs come from, right? But um, the formula to incorporate flotation costs into calculating the weighted average cost of capital is dividend one over the price at time zero minus the flotation cost plus the growth rate. And so that flotation cost will be given to you. You'll see that it's, uh, it, it's one large number for, I don't know, 10 issuing 10 million shares, right? Or it's a given price per share, but uh, it'll be given to you or you'll be given the data to be able to calculate the flotation cost. And there are two methods to account for flotation costs, and they increase the project's WACC to incorporate the flotation costs impact as a percentage of the WACC. But this tends to understate the component cost of new equity. So you don't want to understate costs um, because that can really cause significant problems for your estimates. You could also leave the WACC alone and adjust the project's initial investment upward to reflect the two, true cost of the project, but this violates the separation principle of capital budgeting. Oops, I thought there was more. So it's a trade-off, right? You have to decide which um, method do I prefer and which method gives me the, I guess, the cleanest data and the cleanest estimate given everything I have to work with. So that's it for this particular uh, chapter. Um, it's a short one. You'll, the next assignment will have um, 